Um, so hello everyone, thank you for joining us for this in-depth look at Transference, a filmic interactive experience uh, created through a unique partnership between Spectrovision and Ubisoft. I am Gabe Graziani, your community developer on Transference, and to get started, I'll uh, ask our guests to introduce themselves with their name and their role on the project. Hey guys, my name is Benoit Perichry, Game Director on Transference at Ubisoft. Hi, I'm Elijah Wood. I'm Co-Creative Director on Transference and Creative Director at SpectreVision. I'm Daniel Noah, I'm Head of, per, uh, excuse me, head of Development at SpectreVision, uh, Co-Writer and Co-Creative Director on Transference. I'm Kevin Vacapé, Producer of Transference at Ubisoft <clears throat> Montreal. I'm Kyle McCullough and I'm a Writer on Transference. Thanks for being here, gentlemen. Thank you. Before we get started, uh, why don't we take a quick look at the trailer that we debuted yesterday? Dad? Just a sec, bud. Just what's going on? Okay. Oh, here's your mom. You're gonna sit here real soon, okay? Just hold still. Don't believe this is lies. It's a bit cumbersome, but that's always the way with these new prototypes, huh? And all you have to do is just... Just be. I know things haven't been so great lately, okay? It's okay, I've been a lousy father. I'm unable. Lousy husband, too. My God, you should go to sleep. You've seen how rotten that's gotten now. That is going to change. We're all going to be together. All of our hard work. All of our sacrifices. That's my gift to you. Us. Ubisoft a few years ago um, by a mutual friend who knew that we were interested in, in VR and the exploration of VR for, I mean, primarily our film company, uh, SpectraVision, we make genre and horror films. And VR was a really interesting medium to us for exploring something that could be immersive and experiential. It really lends itself to horror and to genre. So we were kind of just interested in that and knew that Ubisoft was exploring these things as well uh, and had their own kind of VR division. And so we were introduced to E3, um, and we sort of sparked up this idea to head out to Montreal and, and sort of come with a number of pitches on our side of ideas that we had in this space and see if there was an exchange that kind of made sense that could sort of lend to a, a natural partnership. And we found that it was really successful. We had a great time. We got on really well, and I think we shared a lot of similar interests. And ultimately, sort of in that weekend, there was a kind of nugget of the idea that became transference. And we sort of used that as a jumping platform to sort of formally do this thing together, which was really gratifying and exciting to us because we've been video game fans all of our lives and we also love this company, so it was just a, a real treat. Yeah, as soon as we got out of the Ubisoft offices <laughs> after, it sort of was like, okay, we can proceed and do something together. We just erupted <laughs> with joy as soon as the door shut up. I was like, oh my gosh, it's happening. It's really happening. Oh <laughs> yeah. And Kevin, from Ubisoft's perspective, how has that collaboration been going? Well, it's a real pleasure working with these uh, talented people. Uh, it's uh, quite an honor, actually. And uh, right. <coughs> we're talking on a daily basis, uh, iterating, improving on, uh, upon one another idea um, on every, every aspect of the game. 
and um, it's uh, it's quite an adventure uh, exploring the possibilities of both mediums, and it's also a big learning process uh, to all of us on SpectreVision side about how to make games and at Ubisoft on how to build these uh, engaging and deep narrative. So that's a perfect jumping off point to start getting into the narrative a little bit. Kyle, um, can you elaborate a little bit on the background for Transference? Sure, yeah. Um, so at its core, Transference is um, kind of a story, a mystery about uh, obsession. And it, it kind of gets wrapped up into this scientist, Raymond Hayes, who uh, is played by Megan Blair, as you saw in the trailer. And he's obsessed with a lot of these new ideas in science, like taking a human consciousness and uploading it into a virtual space. And, uh, he sort of embodies a lot of other scientists like Ray Kurzweil, who has a singularity theory, and Nick Bostrom, who says there's a simulation theory that perhaps we all are just already living in a simulation already. So we were able to kind of take all of these ideas that are really essential to the narrative by taking uh, this consciousness upload where this guy is absolutely determined to have his family live forever and upload their consciousness into this virtual space, but things don't necessarily go as he intended and the fracture occurs that splits off into the, uh, the three perspectives that you experience in the game that I think is the, the, the real core to the narrative itself. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Uh, so Benoit, uh, environmental storytelling is a term that is often used with this kind of exploration, investigation game. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how that might apply to Transformers? What we, um, we wanted to do is, we don't want to tell the story in an explicit way. Um, we want to, we're planting these narrative seeds everywhere. There's narrative seeds everywhere and we want to let the player to find and connect these dots by himself and try to stipulate what is happening there, because ultimately, the biggest puzzles, I'd say, of this game is try to figure out that mystery, what really happened to them. But more and more, with the fact that you could shift between the perspectives of the different family members, you find that these objects sometimes are different, and it tells a lot about the relationship, and what is happening. Uh, an example, you could have like wedding rings, and, and the master bedroom, and uh, after that, if you switch perspective, uh, these are literally like handcuffs. So it tells a lot about the relationship that one feel close. Um, but yeah. We were also always challenging conventions along the time. There's conversations that we were constantly having. You know, the fact that it is environmental based, oftentimes there are narrative elements that sort of you, you feel you're forced in other games to engage with. Either be it a letter that you have to sit and read um, or some kind of piece of information that you, you're forced to contend with that can kind of pull you out. And we were really interested in trying to seed a lot of the, the, like the entire environment with a lot of narrative elements that didn't necessarily force you to have to explore those things in order to emotionally connect with what's happening and to, and to feel like you have a sense of what's going on. And that was a real challenge for us. I think it was the biggest thing because we want people to understand the mystery of what's happened to this family and to do it in ways that are not necessarily um, fitting into similar tropes that we've seen in other games. Yeah. Uh, just, to be, uh, just to be clear about that, uh, as a first-person exploration game, uh, it's, it's all about the time you, you take to explore, discover the, the item in this environment and interact with them. That will, this is how you will piece together the, the profiles of these uh, individuals and, uh, and unravel the mystery uh, behind the narrative. I want to get back to something that was mentioned just a second ago. Um, and VR is a unique platform for telling stories. It's a very new platform, so it seems fitting to uh, approach narrative in kind of a new fashion. Um, Daniel, can you tell us a little bit about how uh, SpectraVision and Ubisoft have worked together to create a really unique uh, emotional environment? Sure. Well, for, you know, for the first period of, of our process, we were just um, teaching each other how we do what we each do. And I think that it was a very constructive partnership because we were both able to kind of come as outsiders and, 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 and I would say constructively sometimes poke holes in each other's tactics and approaches. And why do you do it that way? Well, what about doing it this way? Um, and, and it resulted in something that I, I think we all feel operates in a pretty unique way. Um, for one thing, I, the, the issue of perspective in VR is one that is like, we think far more complex than it's often given credit for. 
Um, and one of the things that we're very excited about in Transference is that the player is playing him or herself in this game. You are not playing a character. You are a person sitting on your sofa with a controller in your hand, and, and if you're playing in VR, a rig on your head. And uh, so you have a sense of agency as a gamer in this game. Um, but additionally, we really wanted to deconstruct how games even function to begin with in terms of the, what, what drives or motivates the player. This is a game that has no levels, no points, no collectibles, no achievements, no, achievements, no skills to unlock. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't operate by any kind of familiar set of rules. What it does operate by is emotion. And so when we kind of brought together our two disciplines, one of the breakthroughs we had was that typically in gaming, the gameplay and the narrative are teased apart. So you get to a point in the game where you unlock a cutscene and you passively watch that scene. That doesn't work in our game. It doesn't work that way in our game. Uh, you are literally participating in the scenes. There is no uh, segregation between game and cinema. It is, uh, we like to say this feels like a movie and plays like a game. It is li you are literally uh, a participant in what essentially is a feature film, uh, a participatory feature film. That's it's, it's interesting too to note that that doesn't also just apply to sort of the narrative elements and the, the progression, but even the you know things as, as core to the game as the puzzles themselves weren't designed like, okay, this will be an interesting puzzle. How do we write a story to fit into it or vice versa? It was, everything was created at the exact same time. Yeah. And that was part of what, working so closely with Ubisoft, we couldn't have done that otherwise. And to be able to just sit down and be like, okay, how can we both provide a puzzle to get that just mental complexity going in the game, but at the same time require the puzzle to have some understanding of the narrative in order to even begin to solve it and sort of move through. So that was a, that was a really exciting part about having the, bringing the two uh, sides together. Just to, like, if I can add something, like uh, Daniel was referring to, we didn't want to give the player a specific role, like, hey, you're supposed to be this person, this is your job. This is what you need to do. This is how you're supposed to feel related to the character. Um, because, how can I say this? Like, uh, well, it's, it's all about bringing your own experience to the game. Right. Uh, like last year with the Walter Test Case demo, it's, uh, <clears throat> the narrative is all about uh, exploring um, test subject affect, affected by PTSD. And we were seeing people playing this demo and being really affected by, them, by what they experienced because they had a past story that related to that. That's, yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. You don't have to, you know, it's, you don't go into this, everyone should sort of have a unique experience because everyone's not going into it having to play Detective Miller at the third precinct or something <laughs> like that. You know, you literally are bringing yourself and everything that you've learned in your life to the game as you try to connect to these characters. And that I think is what, you know, even with the Walter Test case we saw that, you know, some people had uh, the PTSD sort of experience, and then other people saw a completely different experience and walked away, think you know, thinking uh, their own an entire range of yeah. things with their own interpretation of what they brought. Because we're not trying to make you understand who you are; we want you to just be yourself. Yeah. Just to be clear, the Walter test case is the tree demo from last year. No. Yep. Yeah. Uh, before we move on from this topic. I do want to talk a little bit about uh, performance in the game because uh, I think that's one of the strengths that SpectraVision brought to the project. Um, so if we can talk a little bit about the cast and how uh, how they lend to that sort of atmosphere of perspective and things like that. Well, we took advantage of uh, SpectraVision connections uh, to bring in some talented actors uh, like Macon Blair and um, I'd say our challenge at uh, our challenge at Ubisoft was uh, to seamlessly integrate this live action footage in the game. So first we had to, to pick the best uh, sequences in the game, and then we we also took advantage of uh, of our digital setting to create this uh, uh, floating UI uh, that you can see in the trailer, and that puts the player really at the center of, of this uh, delivery of emotions. <laughs> I guess that, that's the, that's this premium material that makes uh, that makes transference quite unique. Yeah, I mean that was really fun from our side too, just yeah. to be able to write words that we knew were going to be delivered in live action, but not in a standard cutscene, more as part of the the game itself. Mm -hmm. So they would be not something that you sat back and 
and passively watched, but something that would, became a part of the world around you. And that was a, a really exciting part. To, and we're also just so keen to be able to feature Mick and Blair. <laughs> <laughs> massive, massive fan of them. Yeah. Blue Ruin, go see it, watch it. That one's right. It is, it's not Yeah, fantastic. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, the point of view. Um, we've touched on it pretty significantly, um, but I'd like to get into uh, you know talking about how we let players be themselves. Um, how does that work with the interactions with the other characters in the game? Well, in some ways, I think you are the fourth character. They're, right. you know, they're, it's, it's really four perspectives here, yours being, being the fourth. Um, the characters in the game uh, acknowledge you. They ask you for help. Um, uh, they, they are in a state of, they are in three states of, of, uh, of high emotional distress. And uh, you know, if the game works, you, uh, by, as Ben Law was saying, by being in such close proximity to these very emotional beings who seem to be desperate for assistance, you want to help them. Mm -hmm. And the only way to do it is to understand them. So you are a, a force to tap into your own empathy. And, uh, and, and you know, the game, we, we say frequently this game is driven by fear and empathy. Um, you're afraid for them and you care to help them. Uh, so you, uh, you, know, you, you, you are, you, you're, this emotional engine is ideally what, what pushes you through as, a, as an active participant who cares about the people that you're immersed with in this world. So can we talk a little bit about uh, how to get back to sort of like the core narrative of the game, Raymond Hayes, like how does his work uh, sort of impact that family environment? Well, his, you know, he's, he's uploaded the consciousness of his family and something has gone wrong. I mean, the core kind of narrative of the game is to understand what has happened to the family. We do understand that they're trapped there. And as a result of something having gone wrong in the upload process, there's corruption all throughout this environment that we have, that our task is to uncorrupt. But as well, the, the, the individual um, perspectives of each family member have been split and fragmented. And so you are effectively going into each of their consciousness and, and trying to understand uh, who they are and ultimately what is happening. And, and how they see the situation differently, how exactly. they see themselves differently, how they see each other differently, how they see you differently. Um, you know, it's, it, it, it is about subjectivity. And, and it, it's very much about perspective. So that sounds great from like a storytelling perspective. Um, <laughs> but from a gameplay perspective, Benoit, how does this work? How does that work? Um, first of all, you can play everyone inside, inside this plex and also the close by exterior in a different perspective. Progressively, as you advance, you face with problems. Like Elijah was saying, there's zone inside us cor is corrupted and these are linked with puzzles and player need to find out what is the solution. So we clearly draw the player where puzzles and problems are. And we let him after that do the searching. And while he's searching and trying to resolve it, this is where he's assembling and connecting all of these narrative seeds I was talking earlier. So more and more you, you start in, in, in one perspective, you uncover another perspective. Because um, in the Walter test case, when we used the light switch, it was to change a memory period inside uh, Walter's uh, memory. Um, but this time, since it's the same technology from, from Raymond, uh, but this time around, this is what you use to switch between the different perspectives. So more and more, you uncover about uh, more zones. You uh, in the in the trailer at one point, you see the piano puzzles, and you see that the room starts to uncorrupt. But this is where it reveals all of its content, and you can learn more about this character and try to see uh, to attempt to resolve that, uh, that mystery. Um, but you feel as you're getting in that the walls are closing in on you. Uh, there are some really weird moments and when that we could call the team non Euclidean, uh, when you feel that the house is changing, you know, so it's different from one perspective to another. Um, I don't want to say too much because I want to let it be not a miss it you really, but. but it's a really interesting point there that you could, yeah. If you could somehow play the game from just one of these perspectives, you would still get a whole story from one of those, you know, visual viewpoints, emotional viewpoints, and uh, narrative viewpoints. But it still wouldn't actually be the whole story because there's two other people involved that have their own unique perspective on all of these events. So, 
you, you kind of, it's, you know, that's why it's so interesting to actually have it a requirement to solve the puzzles is to switch the perspectives because that goes back to the understanding the narrative that you're actually going to have to switch to understand something about the way someone else saw the event in order to continue. And I, and I think that's a really interesting way to, to integrate the narrative and the puzzles. And then sometimes you take an object from one perspective and it's useful in someone else's perspective. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it tells a lot also about these characters at the same time. Yeah, I feel like that, from what I've played, it definitely feeds into that sense of using emotion to understand motivation yeah. and how that applies to the interplay there. Yeah. So do we want to talk a little bit about um, when this game was announced, we announced it as a VR game, um, and we now are bringing it to also non-VR platforms as well. Um, can we talk a little bit about uh, how those two, both VR and non-VR, sort of interact with each other? Well, uh, <coughs> it was important to us that uh, to share this, uh, this experience with as many people as possible, and, and we wanted the game to be as intense on, on every platform. Last year, with the Walter Test Case demo, we had such positive feedback uh, that we knew it was a great, great fit for, for VR. So from that, we just focused on building this, this unique atmosphere with these uh, stylish neo noir art direction, these creepy and surrounding sound ambience, uh, and it just translates effortlessly to, to the traditional platforms as well. Yeah, I mean, per personally as a lifelong gamer, to, <laughs> the, uh, VR just automatically has immersion. You put the helmet on and you are fully immersed in the game, it really, doesn't matter what the graphic quality is or the sound, you just, you are somewhere, depending on what, what game you're playing. So with Transference, we achieved a really high level of immersion immediately with the Walter Test case, and then transferring it to a conventional platform, it was like, okay, how do we somehow get, that, get those same feelings into this, into conventional, traditional platforms? And that became a big focus and something that I think we really, kind of nailed down with uh, bringing it to just even on the controller. You don't lose a lot of that sensation that you feel when you're playing it in VR. And I think that was big. The fact that also you go hands-on, like if you play with motion controllers, that you actually take the object, observe around, and when you have one object, you go to a light switch to bring it to the another perspective. Um, another really interesting aspect of VR is the fact that if a character is close to you, you turn around the corner and it's right in front of you and it's, it is expressing intense emotion, mm -hmm. he's inside your space like suddenly, so there's a huge surprise there. It's kind of your reptilian brain that starts to react it's like, oh my god, okay, the book. okay, now I'm trying to. It was it started with fear and then it developed with empathy because you understand more and more why they're reacting this way, or you think you do, but uh, <laughs> that's an interesting aspect. 